The story I'm about to tell is a story which I learned very early on in my time as a tour guide in Scotland. I always used to pass by a lot of the places where a lot of this story takes place. It's a very interesting story that spanned movies and even a world famous book. Who's the story about? It's about Deacon William Brodie. Join me on episode number 29 of the Scottish History Podcast to find out more about this man and his life. William Brodie was born on the 28th of September 1741 to a fairly well-to-do family. His father held most of the wealth as a carpenter and undertaker and William and his brother were listed as rights and undertakers themselves by 1774. Brodie's grandfathers had been well-renowned Edinburgh lawyers before their deaths also. So all in all, a well-respected family. Brodie is known more by his title of Deacon rather than his first name, not for any religious reason, but because he was an elected Deacon or President of the Incorporation of Rights in Edinburgh. This made him a member of Edinburgh's Town Council. His main trade was as a cabinet maker. By the late 1770s, Brodie lived alone on Little's Close, named after the Edinburgh magistrate William Little, who built the large mansion there in 1570. The close was renamed Brodie's Close sometime in the 1900s. The house, however, had a series of workshops and stables within the grounds, and this is where Brodie maintained his business. His house was at the top of the Royal Mile in the old town of Edinburgh, in the area known as the Lawn Market, which is very close to Edinburgh Castle. Brodie mainly built his cabinets and did other work for those that lived in the more wealthy new town of the city. Despite Brodie's good standing in the city of Edinburgh, he was a gambler and a womaniser. It is believed that although he married, he also had two mistresses and shared five illegitimate children between them. Brodie first dipped his toe into a life of crime in 1768 when he was entrusted with the keys from an Edinburgh bank, presumably to fit a cupboard or a desk in the property. Brodie, however, copied the keys and a few weeks later he used the copied key to gain access to the bank during the night and walked away with over £800. Brodie appeared to have made that his only flit into crime However, in 1782, his father passed away, leaving Brodie a fortune of £10,000, four houses and, of course, a business. Because of Brodie's standing in the city, he was a member of the exclusive club known as The Cape, which commanded a large member's fee. Brodie had now also began to drink more than before and then discovered the little backroom bar on Flesh Market Close that hosted card and dice games on which Brodie would gamble on. And then he was introduced to the world of cockfighting, which he also ended up gambling on. He quickly found himself in debt due to his nighttime activity, however his regular day job was still doing quite well. Remembering from his exploits at the bank's year before, Brodie then employed a similar tactic. Work in someone's home, copy their keys, wait until they'd gone out and then go in and rob them. Again, the new town was the wealthy part of town and Brodie's workmanship was first class so he always had victims. In 1786, Brodie met an English locksmith named George Smith. 
The two hit it off almost immediately and Brody let it slip about his nighttime escapades. Smith was impressed and wanted in on the action. Together they robbed many old town businesses and homes over the coming months. They robbed tobacco shops, goldsmiths and they even got a massive haul from the Bruce Brothers jewellery store on Christmas Eve of 1786. Pretty soon the work became too much for just Brodie and Smith, so they decided to double their workforce. They employed the help of two other crooks by the names of John Brown and Andrew Ainsley. With double the force they could now rob several properties at the same time. They now were even targeting homes and businesses in Leith, another part of Edinburgh. The gang are then attributed to the theft of the ceremonial mace of Edinburgh University. Brodie planned the heist, yet did not take part. This fell on the three others. The mace, to this day that they stole, has never been found. Then, as with most criminal empires, there was to be the big one. The gang were going to steal the revenues of Scotland, the customs and excise building on Chessel's court in the old town was the scene of their next crime. This crime would be the first time that the gang broke into a property as the key that Brodie had copied did not work, so instead they used a crowbar to wedge open the door. It was also the first time that they carried guns. Ainsley was to stand watch and if any alarm was to be raised it was to be via a whistle that Brodie had bought the day before. The other three would search and rob what they could whilst Ainsley remained outside. Ainsley would end up giving the signal as someone ended up approaching the building. However, no one inside heard it. The first they knew was when they heard and saw someone running around in the building. The gang quickly made their escape, taking roughly £16 in cash and a couple of bottles of wine. Smith secreted their tools and disguises in a wall nearby and they split with Brodie going home to change clothes, at which his sister remarked about, finding it rather odd. With the heat now on him, Brodie left Edinburgh and headed to London. He learned shortly before he departed that his three cohorts had all been captured and at that time it was believed that no one else was involved. Until George Smith decided to talk. Smith was to end up holding a meeting with the sheriff, Sheriff Coburn. Smith told Sheriff Coburn of Brodie's involvement and this was then collaborated with Ainsley. A bounty was then placed on Brodie of £150 with a £50 bonus if Brodie was to be convicted. Brodie reached London on the 12th of March, where he stayed with an old female friend. She too appeared to have some connection to crime herself, due to a letter which Brodie penned to a friend back in Edinburgh. Brodie ended up changing his appearance, and even with the bounty on his head, he was able to roam around London in full view of the London police, without even being recognised. He later jumped a ship to Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Brodie originally planned to escape to America, however he ended up being seen and he was caught hiding in a cupboard in an inn in Amsterdam after someone tipped them off. Brodie was brought back to Edinburgh in chains and alongside George Smith, They were both put on trial for their crimes. Ainsley and Brown managed to escape trial by turning King's evidence, just like William Hare did in uh, the episode that I did on Burke and Hare a couple of episodes back, uh, number 27, so you can head back and listen to that one if you haven't already. Brodie and Smith were found guilty in a trial lasting just 21 hours. Due to the overwhelming evidence, such as keys used in the crimes, Disguises and pistols found in Brodie's home. Brodie and Smith were hung at the old toll booth in front of 40,000 people just outside St Giles Cathedral and only a few hundred yards away from Brodie's own home on the 1st of October 1788. The legend goes that the gallows that were used were originally designed and built by Brodie and he was the first one to be hung upon them. 
Another legend goes that Brody wore a steel collar under his shirt to prevent strangulation. Someone even later claimed to have seen Brody alive and well walking in the streets of Paris. However, it is pretty sure that indeed Brody died on that day and he was buried in an unmarked grave. However, Brody's name does live on. Brody's house cafe set on Brody's close on the Long Market, where Brody used to live. And Deacon Brody's tavern across the street are highly recommended eating and drinking places within the city of Edinburgh. There is also a bar in New York which is named after Brody. If we have any listeners in New York or anyone who's currently visiting New York or even at a point if you're listening to this podcast uh, you know, a few months down the line once uh, hopefully the world is back to normal and uh, you're there in New York City. If you find Deacon Brody's Bar in New York City, take a picture, send it over to me so that I can see what it looks like. However, I do believe that the biggest tribute to Deacon Brody came in 1886 with the publication of a book called The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Scottish author Robert Louis Stevenson. Stevenson became obsessed at an early age with the story of Deacon Brody and used him as inspiration for this famous book. Of course, I'm sure you can see the similarities. Most people know the story of Jekyll and Hyde, a respected man during the daytime, a monster come nightfall. So folks, that's it for another week, episode number 29 of the Scottish History Podcast, all about Deacon Brodie. Deacon Brodie was always a story that I used to tell uh, right at the beginning of a tour leaving from Edinburgh. The tour company that I used to work for used to leave from just outside St Giles Cathedral uh, on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. And one of the first things that was worthy of talking about was Deacon Brodie's Tavern. So it's a story that I've known for quite a long time, probably one of the first stories that I remember hearing when I went out on a tour myself, you know, to learn uh, learn the routes and learn the, the tours and things like that. So um, it's been a pleasure to share this one with you. Uh, if you've enjoyed it, please head over to our um, social media pages, uh, facebook.com forward slash Scott History Pod. Uh, you can catch me on the Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash Scott History Pod. And um, Instagram, instagram.com forward slash Scott History Pod. Uh, but the biggest news which I have for you this week is um, the podcast now has its own official website. Uh, if you head across to www.scotthistorypod.com, it will have links to near enough everywhere where you can get the podcast. If you do listen to the podcast on an additional um on an additional app which is not listed on the website, please send it over to me so that obviously I can get the link up onto the website. Um, the podcast is available on Amazon, uh, Amazon Music and Amazon Podcasts. Um, however, there seems to be an issue with Amazon in terms of they don't actually provide a link for you to, to go and listen to it, uh, which is rather annoying. I even downloaded the app and tried to link through the app and things like that, and it just did not work. So um, if you like your podcasts and everything through Amazon Music, you can just search for Scottish History Podcast on there and you will find it. Um, but at the moment, I cannot find a link in order to link you to it. Uh, the last thing, obviously, uh, as usual before we wrap it up for this week, is if you would like to support the podcast, please consider um, becoming a patron of the podcast. You can do that through the Patreon page, which is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Scott History Pod. And there you can donate uh, either £1 or £3 per month to the podcast, which helps with the running costs and, of course, advertising uh, and things like that. Uh, as of right now, uh, we're one like away on the Facebook page for being 800. Um, so if you could keep sharing the Facebook page, get uh, people involved in the Facebook page. Uh, let's see if we can start a conversation on there and things like that. That would be excellent. So once again, folks, uh, for another week, thank you very much for listening. And I will speak to you again next week. Cheers. Cheers.